So I wanted to take a moment and just thank you all for coming. My name is Liz Kirchhoff and I'm an adult services librarian at the Barrington Area Library. Um, and I have a couple of quick notes for you before we get started today. So before we begin, um, I'd like to ask you to all mute your microphones. Um, just kind of helps us to uh, keep any background noise down a little bit. Um, if you have questions, uh, you can use the chat box to ask them. We'll save a little bit of time at the end um, and then we'll ask our uh, presenter to answer as many as she um, is able to do so. Um, and then also we'll be recording the program and I think that should be ready probably next week sometime. Um, and once that's ready, I'll go ahead and send that all out um, to all of you. So uh, next I'd like to introduce Peggy Simonson. Um, Peggy has been a volunteer with the Citizens for Conservation um, for 16 years. She's the former president of CFC and continues to serve on the board of directors. Peggy is currently chair of CFC's Community Education Committee. Peggy? Hi, thanks Liz. I am also on the board of Chicago Living Corridors, who is one of the sponsors of the program. We're delighted to have the library hosting these programs for us. But Chicago Living Corridors is a, uh, an umbrella group that uh, is, serves in the, in the greater Chicago area with the mission of trying to help people improve habitat on private property, which also includes, primarily includes a lot of people's yards. Uh, Melissa, if you can move the slide. Here we go. Um, the fact is that most of the land in Illinois is private property. So if we're going to improve habitat for uh, the, both the plants and, and, and animals, the birds and butterflies and everything, we're needing to focus on private property. This map uh, is one of our specialties. Uh, I, I want to encourage you to go to the chicagolivingcorridors.org website. You can see this map, it's interactive there. The dots represent individual properties that have been improved in, in, with good habitat. And the colors represent the number of different organizations that were, first of all, were involved with uh, Citizens for Conservation, uh, well, with the Chicago Living Corridors to start with. I'm with Citizens for Conservation and we're one of the organizations that, that helped get this group started. We're the green dots on the map that you see. Uh, and, and each of the different colors is represented by a different organization. And if you go on the map, you, on, the, on the website, you can play with the map and determine which organizations are where. In order for individuals to get their property uh, on the map, if it's, if it's improved habitat, uh, you need to be uh, connected with one of the organizations and these organizations all do site visits. So they, in some cases, well, in all cases, help advise on what property, what uh, plants might be appropriate for your, your ecology. Uh, if you have special issues about, you know, what do you plant in, in wet shade or so forth, uh, they can help you with that. Or if you've already got really, really good uh, improved habitat, uh, you are a candidate to have your, your property added to the map. As I said, with our, our goal to get as much private property as possible. We also have on the website a map that includes the public properties like the forest preserve. So you can see where all of this is trying to create a, a corridor of, of improved property. Uh, well, at the end of, of uh, Melissa's talk today, I'll tell you about our program coming up in uh, April. So we'll get a little more focus on that. We're, we've been doing these, these webinars once a month and also on the Chicago Living Corridors website, you can see videos of the previous programs if you've missed those or if you'd like to review them. And Melissa has agreed to have hers uh, videotaped as, as Liz said, uh, it'll be available through the library, but in a little while, maybe another week, we'll also have it posted on the CLC website. So my pleasure now is to introduce Melissa. Melissa Kustik is the Chicago Region Trees Initiative Specialist, managing projects developed by interagency work groups and helping the Chicago region become the greenest, most livable, most resilient region in North America. Melissa holds a master's degree in plant biology and conservation from Northwestern University, plus a decade of experience in research, education, and outreach, and was named a millennial to watch in 2019 by the Illinois Landscape Contractors Association. Melissa is going to talk to us about native backyard trees. Melissa? 
Thanks, Peggy. <laughs> All right, so thank you for having me this evening. Uh, my name is Melissa Kustik. I'm with the Chicago Region Trees Initiative, and I'm based at the Morton Arboretum. Um, and just, of course, I have to talk a little bit about the organization that I'm with. And really, the Chicago Region Trees Initiative is not um, an, it's not its own organization, but a coalition of more than 200 public and private organizations that are working together to ensure, um, as Peggy said, that trees are healthier, more abundant, more diverse, and more equitably distributed. Um, and we are all a bunch of tree huggers, but ultimately it's about the people who live in this region. So if we can get to the urban forest where it needs to be, it'll improve the lives of the people who live here. So my plan for tonight, um, we're gonna be talking all about backyard trees, but first I'm, I'm going to talk about why we need trees. Um, I'd like to assume that most of you already believe that we need trees, but by the end of this section, hopefully we are all on the same page. Um, then I'll talk about what we know about the trees in this region. Um, and then I'll end with how to pick the right tree for your yard, for your space. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> so we'll start with why we need trees. All right, this next handful of slides um, is just going to touch on some of the research that's out there about the benefits of trees. Um, and there is a large volume of research about this. So I'm really trying to handpick the things that I think are most relevant to this region. Um, so here we go. Um, flooding is a big problem in a lot of parts in seven counties. Um, and trees are really powerhouses for reducing flooding. So for example, 100 mature trees can intercept 100,000 gallons of rainwater per year. And now when I talk about intercepting water, that's the water that's captured on the leaves. So trees are also really great at absorbing water um, through their roots. And the soil that is all around the roots is great for storing storm water. So we are slowing down the water that's going into the sewer system and causing backups into people's basements. So this is pretty significant. Um, I think it's also worth noting that across the seven county Chicago region, we had 13 million ash trees um, prior to the emerald ash borer coming through here. So we've essentially lost 13 million trees, um, and that's the equivalent of 13 billion gallons of water that now has to find somewhere else to go, and that somewhere is going to be our sewer systems and our basements. Trees are also really great for reducing um, surface temperature and the air all around us. I really like this figure. Um, this is a map of just Cook County. Um, and if you see the one on the left, I believe you can see my mouse. Oh, that mouse isn't working. Um, on the map, map on the left, it says temperature. That is surface temperature measured by satellites at the same time of day um, on the same day. So the dark red is the hottest temperatures and the blue color is the coolest temperatures. And I would like to point out that there is a difference of at least 30 degrees Fahrenheit between the hottest and coolest points at the same time of day on the same day. Um, and the map next to it is looking at canopy cover. So if you're a bird flying over the region looking down, how much of the ground is covered by tree leaves? That's how we measure canopy cover. Um, and what's really fascinating is that there's a direct relationship between where the trees are and where the cooler temperatures are. It's measurable, it's observable. Um, for example, if you look down this dark green area um, on the southwest edge of Cook County is the Palos region. Lots of forest preserves, lots of trees. Um, and that's where you'll see also a nice dark blue patch. Uh, you guys are doing pretty great up here um, in the Barrington, Barrington area. You also see pretty good canopy cover and cooler temperatures. So congratulations. Um, if this is something that you're interested in playing with, by the way, we have a really cool interactive map on our website. Um, the base layer is the surface temperature that you just saw. And then there's this neat spyglass that you can move around the map and it'll show you what the tree canopy looks like anywhere that you move the spyglass. All right, so back to the benefits of trees. Um, you know, pretty directly related to the tree's ability to cool the temperature around it. Trees are really great for reducing energy costs. So if you plant trees strategically around your buildings, um, you can plant them to provide shade on your building during the summer to reduce your cooling costs. You can also plant them as a windbreak to reduce your heating costs in winter. Um, you can reduce your energy costs from between five to 25%. Uh, I would like to believe that in this group, I don't need to convince you that wildlife is important. Um, 
but trees are critical as food, as habitat, um, as shelter, all kinds of things for a, a lot of wildlife. And that is particularly true of native trees um, and maybe especially particularly true for oak trees. So all the pictures of animals on this page are actually wildlife that are supported by oak trees in Illinois. Um, and Doug Ptolemy is a name that I think is familiar among this group. He is a scientist out, out on the East Coast and he did a really neat study looking at the number of caterpillar species that are supported by different genera of trees. So for example, oak trees can support 534 different species of caterpillar. Cherries and plums can support 456 species of caterpillar. So by supporting the caterpillars, they are also supporting the migrating birds. Um, and they're also supporting pollination. They're supporting all the organisms that are connected by these food webs. So this is pretty incredible. And you know, if you have room for one big tree, consider planting an oak for lots of reasons, but one of which is that you'll be bringing a lot of wildlife to your yard. All right, we're gonna move more to the socioeconomic benefits provided by trees. Um, one of which is that they're great for increasing your property value. So having a mature tree on your property was shown to increase the value that you can get um, from offers on your house when it's for sale. It also reduced the amount of time that houses spent on the market. Um, and I do wanna point out that this is specific to mature trees. So if you've just purchased a house and you're thinking maybe you'll sell it in 10, 15 years, now is the time to get those trees planted. All right, and it's not just property value that's impacted. There was a study that was done looking at different commercial districts um, and they looked, uh, they compared the ones that had trees and didn't have trees. And if there were tree lined areas where you also had um, commercial districts that increased the revenue by 12% and that shoppers came from further away to come to this area, it becomes a destination. People are more likely to linger and to uh, window shop when it's, when it's cool under the shade of trees. All right, so this is a big year for health. So my last handful of benefits are related to health um, with an emphasis on mental health. <laughs> so uh, there's a fantastic study here that showed um, exposure to nature can reduce your stress hormones and your stress levels. Um, and this impact was especially true if when you went out into nature, your stress level was really high or if you made um, regular visits to nature. So for example, if you have a hike in the woods every Saturday, or if you walk to your park a couple times a week, doing those regular visits will keep your stress levels down um, routinely. One of the particularly cool things that was found though, is that even having a view of nature from your window can produce some of those effects. So perhaps you're having a really busy work week or the weather is crummy, um, you're all gardeners, if you can, if you start planning to make sure that from your windows, you have a view of something wonderful, you know, a shrub that brings in birds or even just a beautiful garden, being able to look out your window and spend a few times just looking at that, sorry, a few minutes looking at that uh, will reduce your stress levels. And being outside in general, being active outdoors has actually been shown to alleviate symptoms of Alzheimer's, dementia, stresses I've already mentioned and depression. So this isn't just you feel better after being outside, but it's actually having uh, measurable differences in the symptoms of some major conditions. And just in case any of you are business owners out there, um, that experience of nature, it's, it's not just reducing your stress, um, but if you are passively enjoying nature, it's actually reducing your mental fatigue. So you're not feeling quite as worn down and what that turns into is increased work performance and increased work satisfaction. So for example, if you happen to run a business and you have any kind of space outside, put some trees in. Um, if you have enough space, certainly put a trail in so that your employees can use and they'll come back and they'll be happier to be at work and they will do better work for you. So, <laughs> um, All right. Um, I didn't want to spend too much time talking about the benefits of trees. Um, so for the physical health, I thought I'd just finish with um, this pretty incredible study. So this is a study that was done in a big city on the East Coast, and they were looking at human mortality from cardiovascular and pulmonary diseases. Um, it was meant to be just a long-term study. They weren't really thinking about trees when they started it, 
but halfway through their study, the emerald ash borer came through and wiped out their ash trees. The city was quick and took down all of those dying ash trees. And what they found was that once those trees were removed, there was a significant increase in human mortality. So trees are actually keeping us alive. So again, this is just a smattering of information about the benefits trees provide to us. Um, if you are interested in learning more, you can visit our website at chicagorti.org slash tree benefits. Um, and that has an annotated big bibliography where you can learn more about each of the studies I talked about and also some more of what is out there. Um, and because these are providing real tang uh, tangible services, economists have been able to put a dollar value to the services that we are getting from trees, which is pretty amazing. Um, it also means that when we invest money in the care of our trees, we can find out what the return on that investment is. So for every dollar spent managing trees and making sure they get to a mature size, we get back $1.37 to $3.09 in return services. And that's depending on which study you look at and which part of the country you're in. <clears throat> Um, so if we want those benefits, we still need to put in the care of the trees. Um, and that care of trees is really important. So I think it's pretty intuitive that the big tree on the left is going to provide more benefits than the small tree on the right. We should still plant new trees because we want them to get to be big like this one on the left. But on the left, this tree will um, provide more shade. It will capture more rainwater. It'll provide more places for kids to climb and decide to become arborists. Um, this big tree is providing a lot of benefits. And that same relationship carries over to the neighborhood scale, to the landscape scale. So neighborhoods that have more canopy cover have more benefits being provided to them than these neighborhoods with, with few trees and minimal canopy cover. So ultimately, um, I hope that I've convinced you that trees are important, um, that Wherever people are, we need to have trees near us as well. Um, and you know, if somebody wants to unmute and let me know that they're not convinced, I can go back and do it all again. I'm not hearing anybody, so I will move forward. Okay, so we all recognize now that we need trees. So let's find out what's happening with the trees in this region. Uh, well, Chicago Region Trees Initiative is big on science to action. So we've collected a lot of data about the trees in this region. Um, some of the data I'll be focusing on tonight is our canopy cover data. I think I mentioned before, if you're the bird flying over the region and looking down, canopy cover is how much of the ground is covered with tree leaf. We also have forest composition data. This, um, this is a mass of data collected from a tree census that was done around the region with random size, random plots where we look at um, species and size of trees. Um, but also collected inventories from our many partners across the region. So <clears throat> we have inventories from municipalities, park districts, universities, uh, museum campuses, all kinds of places. And that gives us a good idea of what trees are planted in different places. This last data set I'll mention in a bit is our oak ecosystem mapping data. So part of this is from survey notes taken in the early 1800s, I think the 1830s. Um, and then also aerial mapping from the 1930s um, and from 2010. So starting with our canopy cover data, just to give a little bit of information about how it is collected. Every county flies what is called LIDAR. It's just an airplane that flies over the region. It shoots down lasers and then the speed at which the lasers bounce back up gives us an idea of what's on the ground. It gives us the sense of texture and of height. And from that, we can use algorithms to figure out what is what. So for example, we can take that point cloud and turn it into a two-dimensional map um, where everything, every point on this map can be identified as one of these land cover types. So the dark green is tree canopy. The lighter green is vegetation. So in this case, it's um, grass or turf, um, but in other areas it can be, it can be agriculture. Um, we also have bare soil, which in this case you can tell is the baseball diamond. Um, water, you don't see on this map, but things like rivers and lakes. Buildings, you can see that it pretty clearly delineated where the flat, tall things were. Um, roads and rails, I think that's self-explanatory. And then other paved is things like sidewalks and parking lots, and you can see those tucked in along the way too. 
so with this mapping, um, we're able to see where we have high canopy cover and where we have low canopy cover. So this is the seven county Chicago region where it's dark blue, we have lots of trees, where it's the pale yellow, we have very few trees. And so looking at this map, some, some patterns come out that are pretty clear. And I think the first one is maybe you look at the edges away from Chicago and you might be surprised to see that there's very few trees out in the far suburbs, um, but that has to do with agriculture. You don't see as many trees um, in soybean fields and corn fields. Although we, we are working to get them more in the riparian areas and as wind breaks. So there is the opportunity to plant more trees there. Um, you also see patches of yellow where there's low canopy cover um, in and near the city of Chicago in industrial areas. So that's another area that we try to focus our attention. But what is maybe the clearest is that canopy cover is not even across the region. There are some areas that need more help than other areas. And so one of the things that the Chicago Region Trees Initiative does with this information is try to figure out where to prioritize our, our time and our efforts. Um, if you're curious, here's another fun interactive map and I'll show you some of the layers that we use in this one. Um, this is the information that helps us prioritize where we work. So it includes things like canopy cover, but also where's the flood risk? Where is there bad air quality? Um, and you may recognize this little missing spot and this little missing spot as O'Hare and Midway. So the air quality around the two airports is abysmal. Um, vulnerable populations. So these are the people who need the most help um, based on socioeconomic data um, and I think age data. And then so we're able to put these layers together, um, including things like surface temperature that I didn't include um, in the maps I just showed you. Um, and then it pops us up this map that shows us what are the areas that need the most focus and attention. And I just have Elsa popped out here just to show you that if you click on a community, it'll tell you what your overall rank is, but also what you are ranked for each of the different factors that are included in our interactive map. So I encourage you to check it out. It's just a fun product. All right, um, I'm gonna, I'm going to move over and shifting attention to um, oak ecosystems. So this is a really neat map um, from the 1830s from surveyors who went across northern, sorry, they went across all of Illinois, they went all across the country, but this is just prior to European settlements. So the point was to assess what's here and to figure out how it can be um, set up. So in the 1830s, these were all the oak ecosystems in northern Illinois, and this is what it was in 2010. Um, just to have a chance to see that again, you see there's quite a big bit of green. Oak trees are pretty important to the history of Illinois. This is where it is as of 2010. We're down to the last 17% of our um, heritage oak ecosystems. And it's not just that we're down to only 17% of it, but that it's been fragmented quite a bit. The patches that exist are sort of spread out across the region and isolated from each other. In fact, we actually have records of the sizes of different oak ecosystems. Um, and by the way, I'm using the phrase oak ecosystems because we have oak woodlands and oak savannas. Um, we have all kinds of different, different ecosystems where oak is an important factor. So altogether, we're calling them as a group, oak ecosystems. But looking at the ones we had in 1939 um, and then seeing how it changed uh, for not even a hundred years later, we, not, we no longer have any parcels that are more than a thousand acres big. Um, we've lost, um, was that nearly 20 of our um, parcels that were between 500 and thousand acres. Um, and we've lost about half of our parcels of oak ecosystems that were between 200 and 500 acres. So it's been broken into smaller pieces and the pieces that are remaining are getting smaller and smaller. So some of the reasons even within the oak ecosystems that we're having trouble getting oaks to recruit and to keep these ecosystems healthy. There's a number of reasons. Um, one of them is the relationship of oaks with fires. So we have had oak ecosystems in Illinois since the glaciers retreated 10,000 years ago. We've also had people in Illinois since those glaciers retreated 10,000 years ago. So as long as we've had oak ecosystems here, we've also had people interacting with them and using fire as a tool to manage those woodlands. 
So the oak ecosystems can no longer survive without that relationship with fire. Um, so if you see the forest preserves out burning, it is a good thing and we encourage that. Um, we also have a problem with invasive, invasive plants and invasive woody plants in particular. So um, I'll list some of them in, in the next slide. Um, but a lot of the problem is that invasive species like buckthorn, they tend to leaf out earlier in spring and their leaves stay on later in fall. So this is providing shade over the native plants and um, reducing the ability of those plants to exist, but also creating a lot of erosion problems. Um, buckthorn also releases a chemical that prevents other things from growing around it and is even toxic to wildlife. So um, these are some of the invasive plants we're having trouble with. European buckthorn, honeysuckle, multiflora rose, oriental bittersweet, Japanese barberry, um, and garlic mustard is not a woody plant, but it all, it's also a troublemaker. So one of the reasons that we're having trouble getting oaks to grow and um, maintain their ecosystems are these invasive plants, which by the way, in the, these invasive plants exist in large quantities on private property too. So this is not something that is um, special to forest preserves. But if you look in your own backyard, you might find something like this that you can take care of, um, and it goes a long way. Another reason we're seeing problems with our oak ecosystems, and I'm sorry, this is just a list of problems and it sounds awful to talk about, um, is that oaks are interesting in that they need a lot of sunshine. Um, so you may have heard that oaks are a slow growing species, and they're actually not. They're just really patient. So an oak seedling, um, you know, the acorn can get in the ground, it'll start to sprout. But if it doesn't have enough sun, it'll just sort of grow very, very slowly, almost not measurably grow until something happens, a tree falls over and creates an open patch of sunlight or something else like that happens. And once it gets that patch of sunlight, that's when the oak will grow faster or at a, a more normal rate. So um, again, thinking about oaks not being a slow growing species, if you're planting an oak in a nice big sunny spot in your yard, it should do great. We would like to encourage that. Uh, there are unfortunately also a number of pests and diseases um, that target oaks. Some of them are already in our area, um, like the bur oak blight and gypsy moth infestations. Um, and there's some that are not quite here and we're keeping an eye out for. But um, it is an unfortunate truth that there are a lot of oak diseases and pests. And it's something that we should keep an eye on. So if you have oaks in your yards, um, I would encourage you to keep an eye on those leaves, those branches, look for anything strange and report it if you have it or get a plant pathologist if you're worried about your oak tree. And because we love um, showing data with maps because it's just such a great way to do this, um, we also have an interactive oak map. Uh, so this one is a, a little more complicated so I should walk through it. These big peachy orangey colors are where the oak ecosystems existed prior to European settlement. These dark blue patches are where we still have remnant patches of oak ecosystems. And these purple lines that are connecting them are proposed corridors for ways to connect these remnants that are isolated from each other. So one of the, the great benefits of oak ecosystems is the wildlife that they support. Um, and so by creating these corridors, if we can plant oaks and companion species and native plants along those corridors, it'll help the wildlife go from one of those patches to another. So, you know, if your home is right along one of these purple corridors, we are not encouraging you to knock over your house and put up a forest. Um, first of all, because just nobody would do it. Um, and second of all, because it's not necessary. If you can put an oak tree in your yard um, and some other companion species around it, it'll go a long way towards supporting the wildlife to be able to connect those two spots. Um, and just because everybody likes to look at um, their relationship to these things, this is a more zoomed in um, picture of Barrington and some of the surrounding communities. On this map, the pre-European settlement oak ecosystems are in gray. Um, and the current oaks are still in this dark blue color. So there weren't a ton right in Barrington, but you are surrounded by some really interesting patches. All right. Um, so from here, I'm going to jump into the part where we talk more specifically about your own yards um, and how to pick the right tree. Um, but first I want to comment on um, why your yards are so important. And Peggy mentioned earlier how much 
how much of the land in Illinois is on private property? And that's largely it. When we look at these canopy maps to figure out where are the trees across the region, we can also find out the ownership of those places where there are trees and where there are not. And so um, besides private land making up 90 to 95% of Illinois' land, 70% of all the trees that we surveyed in our um, census of the trees in uh, the seven county region are on private property. So if we're not looking at what's on your property, we are missing a big part of the puzzle. And um, I know that I said I was gonna help you figure out what to plant in your yard, but I thought I should also have a few slides about before you go planting, also think about what maybe needs to come out, right? Because our yards, um, I already talked about how it's important for connecting the oak ecosystems and how you can bring wildlife to your yard. Um, but trees don't really know boundaries that way that we do. You know, if you, if you have a tree in your yard and a tree out in front of your house that belongs to the village, they're working together. They're sharing resources, they're sharing water, they're both preventing flooding in your basement together. They, they exist as part of a continuous um, ecosystem. So um, in thinking about your yard as part of the larger ecosystem and the larger puzzle, uh, I also wanted to point out those invasive species one more time. So I mentioned that invasive species are one of the reasons that we're seeing um, trouble with oaks recruiting and um, repopulating in our ecosystems. Buckthorn across the region is our most numerous, is our most um, common species. So this horrifying and fascinating pie chart is showing the breakdown of what species we found when we did that tree census across the seven county region. So we were looking at just what species were planted um, and buckthorn made up 28% of all the trees that we found. Um, and by the way, if you guys haven't worked with buckthorn, it's just awful. <laughs> it's invasive because it's so good at what it does. It um, causes a whole lot of problems. This can be a whole nother talk just talking about buckthorn, but um, buckthorn is not alone in being a troublemaker. Honeysuckle also makes up about 2% of the trees that were found. So the, the census was looking at anything one inch caliper and bigger. <clears throat> so, um, oh, we didn't include it. Buckthorn is the most common tree in the Chicago region. Um, and this is based on 2010 data. We just redid the census last year and the analysis will be officially out next month. So unfortunately I can't really reveal any of it, but I will tell you that we have more invasive species than what we did 10 years ago. So it did not go the direction we had hoped for. And most of this exists on private property. So if you have buckthorn as a hedge in your yard, um, this is the year, pull it out. We should probably be starting to turn green right now. It'll be really easy to find. Um, but I will make some suggestions for what you can replace it with in a few slides. All right, so now the fun part. We are all gardeners in this group. We like to um, put new fun and exciting things in our yard. So if you are ready to put some trees in your yard, here is what you should do when you're considering what to pick. Step one is look at the diversity overall of your neighborhood. So I have this diagram up here, um, just to clarify what I mean when I say diversity. If you look, um, it's broken down, there's a community on top, community one, and a community on the bottom, community two. And in both cases, they have four different species, species A, species B, species C, species D. Um, so they both have four species, but the diversity is not the same. The one up here has an even number of each tree. So this has a really good diversity. It's a really good mix, four different species equally represented. Community two still has four species, but they're almost all species A. And so the diversity is not as good. So when I talk about species diversity, um, it's really important to take a walk around your neighborhood. And um, if, you're, if you're good at tree ID, even down to genus, just figure out what you've got. Um, if your neighborhood is mostly maples and magnolias, try to avoid those two species. Um, and it's not just about, you know, trying to maintain some artificial diversity for the sake of diversity, but it's really important. So here's a picture of a tree lined streets. Um, these are all ash trees. And this is that same street a few years later. If you're not looking at diversity, 
So for anybody who missed it, here's the tree line street. And then also summer, a couple years later, you can see it's summer because there is one tree in the background that is still green. Um, if you plant all of the same species, even if it's a really tough species, the second you get a pest or disease that specializes in that species or even that genus in this case, um, you lose all those trees in one fell swoop. Whereas if you had diversified it and planted lots of different trees on the street, you might have lost one or two trees, but it would not have had the same impact. And remember that neighborhoods with more canopy cover get more benefits from those trees. So it really is a big deal to lose this many trees along one block and in one whole neighborhood. And there are quite a few um, municipalities in the Chicago region that are majority maple. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, just so you know, I'm not lying about <laughs> there being more than just the Emerald Ash Borer out there that specializes on the trees it likes as a host. Um, we also have, um, we're all familiar with the Dutch elm disease, which targeted elms. Um, there's quite a few oak pests and diseases, including oak wilt and bur oak blight. The bronze birch borer is um, a challenge for the birches. Um, and back up here, the second on the list, the Asian longhorn beetle. This, many of you probably remember, it's a beetle that we actually did have in the Chicago region, um, I think in 2007, some time ago, 15 years ago, um, and we eradicated it. We were, the city of Chicago was right on top of it. They got rid of it. They cut down a lot of maple trees so that it couldn't spread and we were successful. But since then, it's only a state away and several times, um, the Department of Agriculture has found this beetle um, in pallets and in shipping areas. Sorry, <laughs> distractions. Um, so this is the kind of pest that could come into our area at any time, and it really likes maples and horse chestnuts. Uh, and something I should say about that, if you, if you were impacted, if you noticed the loss of those 13 million ash trees across the Chicago region, we have twice as many maples as we did ash. So imagine the Asian longhorn beetle coming through and wiping out our maple trees. I mean, we would have no trees left, basically. So now is the time as we're planting more trees to think about what you can plant to improve the diversity of your neighborhood or if the region of a whole. Um, and I would, I have to say, maples are not bad trees. I am very fond of maples. We just have an awful lot of them. Um, and so it's not so much don't plant maples as it is plant as few maples as possible and maybe just take a break. If you're a person who plants a lot of trees, take a break from maples for a few years. Um, and it's not just pests and diseases that we have to worry about, um, but climate change is a growing problem. Uh, we've already seen and we're continuing to see the pattern of um, more frequent and more severe storms. So basically just more extreme weather. So overall, our temperatures are getting warmer. Um, but we're seeing it punctuated with major storms and extreme weather. So for example, maybe a milder winter, but there are a couple ice storms in it. Um, so you have to have trees in your mix that can handle something like an ice storm. We're also seeing years where there are some pretty big floods and some years where there are some pretty big droughts. And again, if you have a mix of species being planted in your community, you're not gonna lose all of them because they are susceptible to drought. Um, you'll have trees that are, that there's a mix of them, so something will be surviving. We won't be losing everything. All right, so, okay. You're convinced you're going to make sure that whatever you plant um, is supporting increased diversity in your community. But where does that leave you? What should you plant? Uh, well, it starts with looking at your site and making sure that you're getting the right tree that's gonna grow well in your site. So looking at things like the growing conditions. Um, if you know, basically where you want the tree, how much sun does that spot get? How wet is the soil? It's just like picking any kind of a gardening plant. You wanna make sure that that tree is going to be in a good spot and that, for example, it's not a tree that requires wet soil and you put it in a dry spot so that you spend every day watering it to keep it healthy. You wanna make sure that it's already in a good spot. Um, the location itself is important too. So if you are planting a very big tree, you're not gonna to wanna to put it just a foot off of your sidewalk or driveway or just a couple feet off of your house, right? Give it room to get to its big size. Um, I know it's hard because when we plant these trees, they're so little and cute and they look like they're gonna be cute and little forever, but um, just being aware of the mature size of your tree because we want all of our trees to get to mature size. 
right? So look at how big it can possibly get, and then let's just aim for that size. Make sure it's um, it's far enough away from the gray infrastructure that you could be worried about. So I'm thinking about things like um, nobody wants to have to repair their sidewalks frequently or their driveways. We don't want um, the roots to push into um, foundation walls and things like that. So just make sure you're putting it in a good spot where it's far enough away that that won't be a problem. Utilities are also a big concern. <clears throat> Underground utilities, make sure that you call 811 before you dig any holes on your property. Um, yes, self-explanatory. You don't want to hit any of the buried utilities. It's a free service. Somebody will come out from 811, from um, Julie or Digger, depending on where you live, and they will mark where the buried utilities are so that you don't have to worry about hitting them. Um, and of course, power lines are a big deal. Um, just as I mentioned with not planting too close to your house or to your sidewalk, you're gonna wanna make sure that you're not gonna put a tree that gets to be 50 feet tall underneath your power lines. The good news is that there are plenty of small statured trees and shrubs that you can plant under a power line and not have any problems. Um, so just be cognizant of where it's gonna be. If you do plant a bigger tree under the power lines, as it gets bigger, um, comment will come through and they do have trained arborists and they really try their best. They, they keep with um, the industry standards for how to prune the tree to keep it alive and healthy. But ultimately, it's just better if they don't have to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. And then once you've selected the right characteristics for the site you have, you also have the opportunity to pick what you want out of your tree. So do you want to have native trees and attract native wildlife to your yard? Right? You want that great show from your winter and from your window in the winter. <coughs> also think about structure and form. So in some cases, the structure of the tree just provides interest. It looks beautiful, but some trees also have weaker limbs. And so knowing that about your tree um, before you put it over your child's playset or over the place where you eat dinner outside sometimes, that's probably a good idea. And I will say that the faster growing trees tend to die sooner. Um, and so just keeping something like that in mind. Um, and this is a picture in particular of um, a calorie pear, also known as a Bradford pear or an ornamental pear. They are terrible trees for other reasons. They're also really invasive and they smell bad. Um, <laughs> hate saying mean things about a tree, but this one is uh, not a good tree. Um, but it, it is also known for having weak limbs. So this is one of those examples where um, a strong breeze can do what you see in the picture where the branch has been knocked off. So just um, thinking about these and maybe looking up that kind of information before you plant. Um, and then finally, do you want edible parts? Um, even if you're planting native trees, there are plenty of native trees in our area that provide fruits and nuts that you may um, be interested in, if you can get to them before the birds and the raccoons and the squirrels. But you know, that's part of the story and that's part of the fun. <coughs> All right, so. Um, you've got your site ready. Um, if you need some help figuring out what trees can meet all of those criteria, uh, the Morton Arboretum has this fantastic online tree selector. We also have a, um, a book version, <clears throat> which you can get for free um, at our website. Um, but basically you just put in conditions from your site. So is it under power lines? What kind of sun do you get? What size tree are you hoping to get in this spot? It also asks about soil moisture, um, how much salt you get in the area, uh, and then it asks what you want out of your tree. Do you need, are you looking for fall color or spring flowers? Now keep in mind, the more things you ask uh, yeah, for, the harder it will be to find a tree. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> um, right, so if you're asking for a tree that has spring flowers, fall color, and no mess, that tree doesn't exist. But um, you can try to get what you want. And this list will generate a list that'll grow well in your area. Um, there are more than 200 trees that grow well in Northern Illinois. So you should be able to find at least a couple of species that you can plant in your spots. And of course, once you get that list, compare it to what's in your neighborhood, it, you know, maybe not more maples. All right, so if you're hoping for more of an at a glance, or maybe you're just thinking about replacing um, your buckthorn hedgerow or something, we have this series called Healthy Hedges. There's also Healthy Homes and Healthy Habitats that are part of it. Um, what you see on the screen right now is available as a poster and also as a brochure. <clears throat> um, 
but essentially uh, it's meant to show you what you could do. Like, what are the possibilities? If you remove that buckthorn hedge in your yard, what could you do as a replacement? And so in this example, it doesn't have to be a hedge. You can do a nice mixture of trees and shrubs and perennials and still get that nice effect of having an edge, but have more variety, support more wildlife, maybe get something edible out of it, get more color. Um, and so these are all native species listed on here. And I believe it's sunny on one side, shady on the other. So we, we try to um, accommodate different scenarios. If you are looking to replace your hedges with something that's more of a traditional hedge, we also have um, a piece for that. So these are all tree and shrub species that can be turned into hedges um, and they're all native. <clears throat> um, so again, the idea is that invasive woody plants um, can cause a lot of problems, but just pulling them out isn't going to solve the reason that you had them in the first place. So maybe it's giving you some privacy for your neighbors. Maybe it's just um, some a decorative cover over your air conditioner or something like that. Well, there are quite a few other replacements that'll do that job and then also provide additional benefits and be more exciting. All right, and so um, in addition to all this, the tree selector, the, um, the guides we have, there are a lot of native plant sales out in our region. Um, we have this website, chicagorti.org slash native plant sales. I'm in the process of updating it. So hopefully next week it'll be live with where the spring native plant sales are. But just looking at this map from last year, you can see that almost no matter where you are, there's going to be a native plant sale near you. There are quite a few around there. 99%. And in just about every case, um, they have good information about each of the different species. And so you can figure out which ones they have and ask questions of the nonprofit running it. Um, you know, ask for their advice. Say, I've got a, a sunny spot that's kind of small and gets a lot of salt. Are you selling something that would be good for that? Um, and uh, I couldn't help myself. I did list just three species that are not commonly planted across the region um, based on what we've collected in our uh, inventories. Here are some trees that are native to Illinois, um, some native to our region. One, this one is not specifically to the Chicago region, um, but that do pretty well and are not seen very much. So the cucumber magnolia, it is magnolia, so you get those pretty fuzzy buds, but you also have this really neat hot pink fruit. Um, it's a big tree. So this is a 50 to 80 foot tree that likes full sun. Um, but you don't see a whole lot of them around here. So it might be one to try out. Persimmon is another fun one, and this one has edible fruits. Um, one of the pro tips I heard recently, because persimmons, if you pick them at the wrong time, if they're not perfectly ripe, are very astringent and will just dry out your mouth in the, in the first bite. Um, if you wait till it drops to the ground and then harvest it, that's a, a good way to know that it's ripe. Again, this is one you'll be competing with raccoons for it because they are delicious. Um, and then the last tree I'm highlighting is sassafras. These ones smell really neat. They have great fall color and they're a smaller tree. <coughs> Excuse me. So they're really between 20 and 30 feet. So it's good for more of a small area. And again, they're not planted all that much in our region and they're just lovely. Okay. Um, so as I started off this presentation talking about the benefits that trees provide, um, I like to reiterate and just use that repetition. That those benefits only really, not only, mostly come from the bigger trees, so from the mature trees. Uh, and so we need to make sure that when we plant these trees, we don't just put them in a hole and then walk away. One of the unfortunate things that we were able to find with some of our data collection, this comes from that tree census in 2010, when we looked at the species and size of trees at random plots around the region. Um, in this chart, um, on the y-axis, we're looking at the abundance. So these bars totaled together is 100% of all the trees that we found. And along the bottom is the size class. So all of these trees are between one and six inches in diameter. So we took a ruler up to a tree, that's how wide the trunk is. That's 75% of all the trees in our region are six inches or smaller in diameter. The next group is between seven and 12 species, and that's about 15%. So, 75 plus 15, 
boy, I should have had that planned out ahead of time. Ninety percent of our trees um, are twelve inches or smaller, so we're planting trees, but they're not growing to the bigger sizes, and certainly not as much as we need them to. So, how can we get our trees to the big size? Well, a lot of it has to do with care. Um, this horrifying figure is what plant pathologists call the death spiral. <laughs> um, and the idea of it, and I'll walk us through it in a second. The idea is just that stressed trees attract the things that end up killing them. So this outer ring is what we call the predisposing factors. The next ring in is the inciting factors. And then the next layer is the contributing factors. And then the very center of the spiral is tree death. Um, and so these are all factors that contribute to, to a tree's death. So the predisposing factors are the things that might make a tree stressed out to begin with. Things like, is the soil around your tree compacted? Um, is there soil, sorry, salt in the soil? Um, is there air pollution in this area? And then once those factors start to weaken the tree and just make it a little bit stressed out, the inciting factors start to cause more stress and more problems. So that's things like defoliating insects. So the insects that come and eat large patches of the leaves, um, excavation near the tree, uh, frost damage. These are things that are now further weakening your tree and leading to the contributing factors, things like the canker fungi, um, viruses, nematodes, things like that will, that will come in and deliver that death blow. So ultimately, the take home message of this horrible spiral is that um, if you can take care of your trees and make sure that they are uh, watered and pruned and being checked on, you're gonna go a long way towards making sure that those trees uh, reach adulthood basically, and provide the benefits that we are looking for. So some of those ways that we can do that, um, I'm just gonna go over planting and care to make sure that when you plant those trees in your yard, you're doing it right and we're getting big trees, or if they're meant to be big, mature trees. So first of all, planting. This seems like it should be so simple. It should just be dig a hole, put the tree in, ta-da, you've planted a tree. But there's actually a huge amount of research about the right way to plant a tree and the ways that you can plant wrong so we know how to avoid those. So what we've come up with um, is that when you're digging a hole, you want it to be two to three times as wide as the root ball. So the root ball is when you buy the tree, however, if it's in a container or if it's balled and burlapped, if it's in a grow bag, plant it two to three times as wide as that. Tree roots do not go very deep. They're mostly in the top 18 inches of soil but they will grow as wide as they are able to grow. Um, often three times as wide as the canopy if they have the ability to do that. So you wanna make it so that those tree roots immediately start to grow wide. You don't want them to have to figure out other ways to go like around or deep. <clears throat> so plant, dig the hole two to three times as wide, but the most important part is the depth of the hole. You want it to be only as deep as you need it so that when you put the tree in the ground and fill it with soil, that this root flare, where, this, where the trunk starts to flare into the root, is visible above the surface, surface of the soil. So you can see the soil line continues here and this curve is above it. <clears throat> um, once you've got it in place, make sure that the soil is in firmly but not compacted too hard. Um, Trees are not sentient creatures. They will go where it's easiest to grow. So if you compact it too hard, you make it hard for those roots to grow out wide. Um, water it right away after you've planted it. Um, and I'll talk more about watering after the initial planting in a few slides. But then after you've watered it, you also want to put down a layer of mulch. So the, uh, you know, I'll reiterate a couple times if I have to. The right way to mulch is to use two to four inches of mulch as wide as you're comfortable going, but typically at least as wide as the branches of the tree you're planting. And then once you're done putting on the mulch, pull it back away from the tree trunk. You are mulching the soil, not the tree. So that mulch should never touch the tree's bark. So put it down and then pull it back from the bark of the tree. Um, because I talked about mulch, I thought it's really important to talk about why we put the mulch down because it really is an important part of the tree planting process. <clears throat> um, it does a whole lot of things. First of all, it supports the microorganisms that you want in your soil. Your soil should be alive. There should be a lot of stuff living in it because that stuff coexists with your trees and improves its health. 
Um, but one of the neat things about attracting those microorganisms to your the soil by your tree's roots is that the waste products that come out from all those decomposers is acidic. And most of our soil tends to be very alkaline. And all you really need to know about that is that having those organisms release that waste makes our soil more neutral, which makes it easier for those trees to um, absorb nutrients. So excellent part there too. Um, mulch is also really good for retaining moisture in the soil, makes it harder for this, the water to evaporate out after a rainstorm. Um, it's important for temperature regulation. Tree roots can't handle um, major temperature changes uh, very well. And so having that Honey. layer of insulation helps to keep the soil temperature from fluctuating too much. And then this last one, having mulch around your tree prevents what we call mowaritis. It is an absolutely made up term, um, but it's still common in our industry. It just refers to the tools that you use to maintain your turf. Um, if it gets too close to the tree, it can sometimes nick the trunk or even create big slashes on the trunk. And that bark is what is protecting the inside of your tree. So if you nick it, you've just caused um, an open wound that can invite pathogens. You can be cutting off the vascular tissue, which is how the water goes up the tree and how the carbohydrates come down the tree. So if you are bumping into the trunk of your tree, you could be causing permanent damage. And so that mulch just prevents your lawnmowers, your string trimmers from getting even close to the trunk and you never have to worry about it. And if all these things I just mentioned about why mulch is great um, haven't sold you, I just like to show this one diagram. It's from a research, <clears throat> from a study that was done um, looking at what was underneath trees. Oh, there's my mouse. Um, and they just took soil cores, where it's like a big tube they stick in the ground and then um, had some poor research assistants actually wash all the roots out and measure them and count them. Um, and what you see is that in places where there's mulch under the tree, you have quite a few more of the fine roots that are doing all of the water and nutrient absorption. Whereas under turf grass, there's not a whole lot going on under there. So mulch is creating a healthy environment. You're mulching the soil to create the right environment for your tree, as long as you're doing it the right way. So as I mentioned, you're mulching the soil, you're not mulching the tree. And when you pile up the mulch along the trunk, you're causing a whole lot of problems. Um, one of those problems is that you could be rotting the base of your tree because remember that mulch holds moisture. And so if you're holding that moisture at the base of the tree, you're creating a weak spot right at the base of this thing that is going to die slowly. So in the meantime, it's getting big and heavy and now you've created a weak spot right at the base. Um, that's dangerous and we don't like that. We also see um, what is called girdling roots or circling roots. So again, trees are not sentient creatures. They are not thinking, oh, I should grow this way because it's more stable. They're, they're following tropisms. Um, so the roots are gonna grow where it's easiest to grow and where they can still get water and nutrients. Well, if you have a giant pile of mulch, um, that's probably decomposing, it's holding water. Um, and so the, and it's much easier. It's not nearly as compact as even decent soil. So the roots will often grow up into the mulch pile and start circling around the tree's trunk. And as the tree gets bigger, those roots will basically choke the tree so that it can't grow any wider, but it's also cutting off that thin layer of vascular tissue that's right underneath the bark that, as I mentioned before, is bringing the water up and the carbohydrates down. <clears throat> so all this to say, um, don't pile the mulch on the tree. If you uncover a tree that has been piled up like that and you see these circling roots, in this case, it's small enough you could probably um, fix those roots. Trim them neatly with, with a good clean edge um, and straighten them out. But if you wait too long, you'll get a tree like this. Um, and without actually going there, I couldn't tell you if there's a way to fix this, but this is a tree that definitely had the mulch piled up too high. Those roots circled right around. As I mentioned, you want those tree, the roots to go wide and away from the tree. That's what keeps it stable. So um, you'd have to bring an arborist in to see if there's anything that could be done about a tree like this. <clears throat> all right, so bringing it all home, um, plant the tree the right way, mulch it correctly, and then watering it is actually pretty critical. So in the first three years after you've planted the tree, those are the years that sort of make or break the tree's ability to get to a mature age healthily. So once the tree is in the ground, you're gonna to wanna to water it um, 
there's a couple of different ways to measure it. They're not all the same, but a decent rule of thumb is if you did 15 gallons of water each week. Now, if we've had a whole lot of rains, you don't have to worry about it as much. Um, after those three years, you're gonna to wanna to continue to water it. Those trees still need water. Um, but also as you go out to water that tree and make sure it's got what it needs, especially during a drought, it's also your chance to just check on it. Are there any strange insects on that tree you've never seen before? Is there a branch dying and you're wondering what's going on with it? The more you go out and spend time with your trees, watering them, checking on the mulch, those are your opportunities to do a quick assessment to see if you need to bring in some kind of plant health expert or, you know, is it just looking good? Um, so touch base with your trees. <clears throat> Um, and with that, uh, I'm happy to take questions, although I think somebody from um, the Chicago Living Quarters is going to let you know what's happening next month first. Melissa, do you have the, the next slide? I do. Okay. Uh, in April, I'm going to promote my own program. Uh, we're talking about uh, all sorts of plants available for a native shade garden. Uh, spring ephemerals all the way through what you can have in the fall for the birds and butterflies, particularly the, the monarchs that are migrating. So um, we're talking about uh, both the uh, forbs as well as shrubs and, and, and trees. Uh, for their conditions that, that are the, the kind that grow in the shade. This will be on April 22nd, again at 7 p.m. It's a Thursday night. So uh, Liz will be sending out the registration as she did for this program that you'll be able to, uh, to sign up to, do, to uh, participate. Well, great. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming along. And um, we appreciate having you all. And thank you, Melissa. My pleasure. Thank you everybody for being here tonight.